Good evening. Happy Friday. I've been kind of putting this off. It's a long opinion, and I started going over it uh, this morning in the car, uh, but I didn't think that would really give it justice. So I figured I would do it this way, where you can see what I'm talking about, and we can go through the Leon Valley opinion, where essentially most of the case against the defendants, Salvaggio, the other uh, police officers, and the city of Leon Valley, uh, most of the case was dismissed. Now, I am not going to bury the lead. The entire case was not dismissed. There's, there's a few moments that are bright and shining. These aren't, this isn't it. Uh, this is the, uh, basically, this is a list of people whose claims get to go forward, or at least some of their claims get to go forward. Mark Brown, uh, he's the tall guy, Tucson police, Tucson police suck, I think is his handle. Uh, he is the enormous pothead who came out. Let me, let me, I guess, set the stage a little bit. Uh, back in 20 forever ago, was it 2018? Yeah, 2018. Uh, back in 2018, Jose Padilla went to Leon Valley for what reason? I don't know. Was walking through the police department, went into the uh, civil side of the things where like the city manager's office was and other, other uh, city employees where their offices were. And he was uh, encountered by Salvaggio. And Salvaggio was like, what are you doing? Why are you in here? Uh, Padilla was uncooperative, shall we say. It ended up with a wrestling match on the floor that Padilla lost. And uh, Padilla was trespassed, if I'm not mistaken, from the city of Leon Valley property. From the property. Anyway, a few days later, he came back with Mark Brown on the 14th, June 14th. He came back with Mark Brown. And the way I remember it is slightly different than the way the court remembers it, because the court is going to put this in the light most favorable to the person opposing the motion to dismiss. So this is in the light most favorable to the uh, plaintiffs. Uh, but the way I remember it was Jose Padilla went on to the court steps after he had been trespassed from that property. I could be wrong. Uh, the police recognized him as having been trespassed. And uh, one of the police officers went to go arrest Padilla. I'm trying to remember. I guess I could look up the videos, but it doesn't really matter for the purposes of this. I'm just trying to give you a, a background on it. One of, the, one of the police officers went up to arrest Padilla. Uh, Mark Brown, Tucson sucks, Tucson police sucks, uh, like tried to interfere. He tried to run interference with Padilla. For what reason? I don't know. Maybe that bond of friendship, or maybe he was just too dumb to know better. Anyway, he got, uh, he got pushed back into the street initially by the guy who was going after Padilla, and then two other cops uh, tackled him and tased him, and there you go. That, I guess that was the catalyst, because then on the 18th, June 18th, everybody went down to the police station, and they were uh, protesting and they and they went like a block away and they drew stuff on the sidewalk. And I mean, it was it was kind of weird, everything that was going on, but it was going on. And, you know, people have a right to protest and all that other fun stuff. Anyway, uh, people were uh, trying to protest. They had a. It was a uh, it was Texas Wolfman had a. Uh, had a flag. I think they all had the flag, but I think Texas Wolfman had the flag and he was like stepping on it in the entryway to the Leon Valley Police Department. And someone came in. He stepped aside to let them through the doors to get into the police station. But the police were like, oh, he's blocking the passageway. And they ran out and uh, arrested him. And then they arrested other people who were around him. And they, they detained a bunch of other people. And that was a big cluster. And that really pissed everybody off. And, uh, and so then on the 23rd, 
there was the big get together in Leon Valley and people drove in as far away as from Bethville, Ohio. And the, the you know, that was basically, there wasn't a lot going on there. People were just kind of standing around protesting Leon Valley. And then and it seemed like it was all pretty cool. And then uh, Zavagaro came out and said, hey, everybody gather around. I'm going to give a press conference. And everybody gather around. And he was like, hey, if I remember correctly, he said something along the lines of, hey, you're all under arrest. <laughs> and then all the little police officers were like trying to arrest everybody. Uh, I say that like it was funny, but it's funny in a bad way. Anyway. So. This has wound around for quite a long time. Like I said, this did happen in 2018. It's now 2022. Uh, there's a saying that I like to say that justice delayed is justice denied. But here we are uh, four years later, four years and basically a month later. So what happened? Uh, Mark Brown gets to continue on with uh, his excessive force claim. Uh, that gets to go to trial. I don't think he's got a good chance on that. I'm just going to say I don't think he has a good chance of prevailing on that. But that gets to go through to trial. As far as the First Amendment retaliation, I don't think that's going to succeed. Because basically what he has to do, if I understand it correctly, is he has to say the cops used excessive force on me because I was filming. I don't think that's going to be successful, but he, he's going to get to make the argument. David Bailey, uh, two counts get to go, uh, the false arrest. Uh, now, the false arrest might not have to go to trial because the court already thinks that uh, the false arrest was bogus. And the court has issued an order to show cause to the defendants as to why the court shouldn't just grant summary judgment on the false arrest. So that means that the court has reviewed the evidence. And as far as the court can see, the plaintiffs should have asked for summary judgment on that and didn't. So the court's like, hey, just sua sponte, defendants, why, why should this go to trial instead of being decided right now? Uh, but then what will have to go to trial is whether or not the, the uh, cops arrest him. This is, again, for, the, uh, for blocking a passageway whether or not that was for First Amendment retaliation. I think he has an excellent chance on that, just like he has an excellent chance on the false arrest. So that's a, that's a bonus. Juan Gonzalez. Juan Gonzalez was uh, placed in cuffs. He wasn't arrested, but he was placed in cuffs for a substantial period of time, taken in, identified, and all that other fun stuff. At the same time, right after, I should say, uh, Bailey's arrest. Uh, so he... He gets the same kind of treatment on that because they didn't have any probable cause to arrest him for anything, but they put him in cuffs and brought him inside. And it, it, that looks and smells like a, that looks and smells like an arrest to me. And then uh, first amendment retaliation, again, excellent chance of success there. James Mead, same thing. They put him in cuffs and uh, he, he uh, probably will succeed on a, on summary judgment and, and then it gets to go ahead as far as the First Amendment retaliation. Excellent chance of success. Uh, Jonathan Green, he was arrested on the 23rd. Now, his arrest on the 23rd was for resisting arrest. And the court found and the video showed that the cop said, you are under arrest. And he said, OK, he put down his phone and his cigarette because the dude's just a chain smoker, or at least he was, and held out his wrist to get cuffed. That is not resisting arrest. And so the court said, yep, on this one, uh, the video of it's pretty clear. So please explain to me in detail why I shouldn't grant summary judgment on that. Now, he also claims that there was excessive force. I think something along the lines of while he was cuffed and inside, uh, Officer Valdez grabbed the cuffs and yanked them up, uh, dislocating his shoulder or injuring his shoulder. Uh, and then, of course, the First Amendment retaliation. So uh, as far as the false arrest, excellent chance of success. As far as the First Amendment retaliation, I think excellent chance of success. Uh, the excessive force, that's 
that's going to, in my opinion, if it does get to trial, come down to a question of believability. Is the jury going to believe Officer Vasquez and all of the other cops who are going to testify that Officer Vasquez was a good boy who didn't do nothing? Or are they going to believe uh, Jonathan Green, who has a shady criminal past and, well, let's just say that he looks like he eats a lot of gas station pizza and smokes a lot of meth. Uh, and then Jason Green, uh, he doesn't get any summary judgment or the, I guess, the probability of summary judgment. Uh, he, like Jonathan Green, was placed in cuffs on June 23rd. I don't believe he was arrested, but he was placed in cuffs and detained in cuffs inside the, uh, inside the police station for, I think, about an hour. And uh, he has an excellent chance of success on prevailing there because they, they didn't have probable cause for anything. And on the First Amendment retaliation, he has an excellent chance of success. So that is, that is the good stuff. So uh, now the bad stuff. This is the stuff that I didn't like. I didn't mind a lot of the things in here. I didn't think that like James Springer had a claim. I didn't think that uh, Pierce, Jonathan Pierce, whatever his name was, Ethics Instead, I think he went by. I didn't think he had a, a good claim for anything. But who I did think had an excellent claim were all the people who gathered around for the press conference and were detained for, I believe it was over an hour. They were detained for a long time in the summer. It was outside, but it was a long time in the summer in Texas. And they weren't allowed to leave. And they were, they were literally outside of a police station. Now they weren't placed in cuffs or brought inside the police station. But in my heart of hearts, I would, I would call that an arrest. That wasn't an investigatory detention. They didn't have a reasonable suspicion these people had committed any crimes. As far as I know, I believe that uh, Salvaggio tried to say, well, we don't know who's, who's been sending these threats. Well, look, bro. <laughs> you have to have a reason that cri reasonable suspicion that crime is afoot. Articulable facts that would support that. And not just that crime is afoot, but that you're the person committing the crime. It's not just, oh, I think somebody somewhere might be committing some sort of a crime. And so I get to stop and frisk everybody. No, 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 son. It has to be some sort of a particularized suspicion, is I believe the way the men in black robes like to call it. A particularized suspicion. So I, I would have called this an arrest. I would have called it arrest. Now, the the court didn't. Or let me let me rephrase this. The court said, yeah, yeah, the cops violated your Fourth Amendment rights, but there's nothing clearly on point that would that would say that this was an arrest. Well, I don't know if I don't know if you remember uh, Terry v. Ohio, but the, the court always said, you know, a brief detention, a brief detention, a brief detention over an hour. It's just really difficult for me to say that's a brief detention. I mean, we might quibble as to whether like 15 minutes is or isn't a brief detention. You might even come up with a good argument why 30 minutes is a brief detention. But an hour? An hour. An hour to do what? To get their names? To uh, collect their phones? To seize their phones? Eh, you know, I, I'm sorry, you've, you have pushed the bounds a little bit for me. You've pushed the bounds a little bit for me. But the court found that, well, you know, there's nothing directly on point. So, you know, it's not clearly established in this jurisdiction. I kind of have, I kind of have a, a bit of a beef with that. It doesn't have to be like exactly like a, there doesn't have to be a, a circuit court decision that is that is directly on point. It could be close. It just has to put a, a reasonable officer on notice that what they're doing is probably a constitutional violation. Now, I'm obviously oversimplifying it a bit. I don't think it really warrants me going into it. If you really want to read the uh, 
the memorandum that the uh, court wrote, you, you sure can. But I, I'm just telling you that I was hoping for more. I was hoping for better. I, I thought that there was an excellent chance that, that the plaintiff's attorneys would have been able to scrape up decisions that around, around this case, state law decisions, because you could use state law decisions, or at least in the Ninth Circuit you can, to support the fact that the officers should have known that what they were doing was a constitutional violation. So, you know, I, I, I had expected this would have been decided in the plaintiff's favor. I hoped it would. And it saddens me that the officers are getting off on the uh, qualified immunity. So I guess I will go into it a little bit. So when they're talking about the qualified immunity, to be sure that that authority indicates the Fourth Amendment does not permit the stopping of potential witnesses to the same extent as those suspected of a crime. In two cases arising from the same set of facts, the Fifth Circuit applied Brown versus Texas, balancing test to a witness's detention when the officers handcuffed her and left her in the back of a police car for almost two hours. In both, the circuit, the Fifth Circuit held that the officers unreasonably seized the woman. Although it may have been reasonable to detain the woman for some amount of time to determine her role in the situation, the officers exceeded this authority when they detained her in the back of a police car for two hours. And in Freeman, the Fifth Circuit held that an individual who was handcuffed and placed in the back of a police car for some 30 to 45 minutes was restrained to an extent that normally accompanies a formal arrest. Yeah, well, you know, somewhere in the middle between those two is about an hour. And I get it. I get it. Handcuffs in the back of a police car. It's a lot more. It's a lot more indicative of an arrest. But you have lost the same amount of liberty by being detained, unhandcuffed, forced to sit on a, on a stone bench in front of City Hall, you've lost the same amount of liberty that way as you have if you've been put in the back of a patrol car. You're not allowed to leave. You're not allowed to move. I don't understand why, I don't understand why they're saying it's been an unreasonable amount of time just because there's no cuffs involved. And some people like cuffs. You're going to say, well, you know, cuffs are uncomfortable and whatever. Some people dig it. Some people do it for fun. So don't come at me with that nonsense. I just, I just, I, I really struggle with this part. I don't like it. So I think that's really my biggest point. I can't, I can't say that the court was, was wrong, but I think that if the court wanted to, the court could have come up with a justification for it. Or maybe it was the plaintiff's attorneys who, who failed in this particular aspect, didn't do enough research, hoped that they'd get by with the uh, authorities that they turned up, I, I guess, Freeman and Turner. Yeah, I, it just beggars belief to think that in the entire Fifth Circuit, there have only been two cases of detention like this. Only two. I mean, the, the Fifth Circuit's a pretty big place. And... I would beg your belief to think that Texas doesn't have something on it where where Texas found that, you know, cops can only detain people for X amount of time before it becomes essentially a de facto arrest or where it essentially uh, is becomes an unreasonable seizure. I, so the way the way the reason why the facto arrest comes into play is because it goes past reasonable suspicion into probable cause, but they didn't have a reasonable suspicion that these people committed a crime in the first place. They, they thought they might be witnesses. It's just, none of it makes sense. None of it makes sense to me. I really wanted, I really wanted the plaintiffs to win on this particular issue, but they didn't. So there you go. The second one, the second thing that I really didn't like was the unlawful seizure of property. Now the court recognizes that all those people who uh, were seized on the 23rd of June. They all had their phones taken. Actually, pretty much everybody involved in this, Salvaggio loved taking phones. He just, he just took phones left, right, and center. I mean, if it was a phone, he was taking it. You know, if a, if a little kid at a restaurant near him was, was playing on his mom's phone, Salvaggio would seize it as property or something, evidence of a crime. I don't know. The dude loves stealing phones. Anyway, so... 
So the court goes on to say that this, oh, yeah, 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 it was a seizure. It was violating violating the uh, Fourth Amendment. But you know what? You can seize things for a very short period of time. We've got this we've got this case, uh, United States versus place. And the court said in United States versus place that basically you can seize something akin to like a Terry stop in in United States versus place, which the court goes into. But I this one really like I boom. So in the United States versus place, uh, DEA agents, I believe, were watching someone who was who was flying from Miami to uh, New York. Right. And he had some luggage with him and they thought this guy's this guy is transporting drugs. So they watch him. They watch him. They watch him. He gets into New York and uh, and he goes to pick up his bags. And the cops are like, hey, we want to search your bags. And he's like, no. And they're like, well, we're taking your bags, sucker. And we're going to get a, a judge to look at these and, and give us a warrant to get into them. And so they took these bags and like 90 minutes after they seized the bags, they, t- they, had, they took it somewhere and had a dog sniff them. And the dog hit on one of the bags. And so they get a, later, they get a warrant and they get to go through the bag and they find drugs, right? So, so dude's guilty. Great. Congratulations. But the court, the court said that that 90 minute delay... That was enough. The 90 minute detention of respondents luggage is sufficient to render the seizure unreasonable. So just the 90 minutes was unreasonable. Taking taking dudes luggage for 90 minutes. Now, I'm going to ask everybody out here listening to this. Would you rather have the like, let's say you flew into into New York. Let's say you didn't live in New York and you flew into New York. You get off the plane in New York. You grab your luggage and a cop says, hey, look. You get to leave here, but either you give me your phone or your luggage. Which one are you going to walk out of there with your phone or your luggage? I guarantee you, you're walking out of there with your phone. I guarantee you, you're walking out of there with your phone. Your phone is more important to you than luggage. A 90 minute detention of someone's luggage was unreasonable. In this case, Leon Valley had these phones for years, plural years. Uh, so they talk about uh, United States first place. Uh, in place, the Supreme Court held that brief detentions of personal effects may be so minimally intrusive of Fourth Amendment interests that strong countervailing government interests will justify a seizure based only on specific articulable facts, the property contains contraband or evidence of a crime. And, uh, and no, the cops fail on all this crap. The, the, court, the court says, nope. The court, the court says, no, these guys don't succeed on any of this. Nope, nope, nope. <sighs> so then the court says, well, you know, despite the constitutional violation, Defendant officers are still entitled to qualified immunity. And you think, why? Why? 90 minutes depriving someone of their luggage for 90 minutes was an unreasonable seizure. But having a phone for years isn't? At the time of these seizures, no law existed that clearly established that warrantless seizures of witnesses recording devices were unlawful. Yeah, you know, place really seems like a court could have could have drawn a pretty clear roadmap from place and seizing luggage for 90 minutes to a cop should know you can't take someone's phone. I, I don't remember. There are there are cases on point where. Uh, where I believe it's the Supreme Court held that like your phone is like a special, it, it, ha- it has special significance to people. All your passwords are in your phone, you know, all your friends and family, all your private communications with your wife, your girlfriend, your husband, your lover, your uh, whoever, whoever, you know, the person you're cheating on your wife or girlfriend with. I mean, it's all on your phone, right? It holds a special significance. Ah, it just, this just bugs the living crap out of me. So the, to the court's knowledge, only two federal courts of appeals have considered this issue. So the court, again, they're only looking at court of appeals. And again, to me, I can't imagine that the Fifth Circuit hasn't had something on point 
or Texas hasn't had something on point. Because again, you could point to state to states and say, look, this state where these officers were in has already has already found that it is a Fourth Amendment violation to take someone's phone and have it for more than X amount of time. To the court's knowledge, only two federal courts of appeals have considered this issue. See Crocker, and that was uh, Crocker versus Betty, where uh, the 11th Circuit found these concerns persuasive. Police had seized a cell phone of a bystander to a car accident. The court affirmed a finding that police had violated the Fourth Amendment, refusing to apply a qualified immunity defense because the right to be free from warrantless seizures of personal property absent applicable exception was clearly established at the time of the seizure. So Crocker versus Betty in 2018, they found that it was already clearly established in the 11th Circuit. I just can't imagine. I just can't imagine that in 2018, the Fifth Circuit was still trying to figure out whether or not cops could just take someone's cell phone and keep it for years, uh, plural. I struggle with that. And then there's uh, Robbins, and it was uh, Robbins versus Des Moines, Robbins versus City of Des Moines. Crocker was issued mere months before the events in this case. Okay, so let's just parse this out. Crocker, the 11th Circuit decision, was issued months before the events in this case. It was issued sometime in early 2018, months before the events in this case. But the police held on to these phones years. That means into like 2020. So... Like, at what point in time are you going to say, well, the cops in 2019 should have known. In, in 2020, they should have known. Like, that just, that just drives me nuts. I'm sorry. Robbins was issued years later. Uh, Robbins was 2021. So Robbins, maybe not. But Crocker, definitely. And USV Place, ah, uh, just, mm. Both are out-of-circuit precedents. Plaintiffs must show existing precedent has placed statutory or constitutional question beyond debate. I don't think so. It doesn't have to be existing precedent, at least not in Ninth Circuit. Maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just reliant too much on Ninth Circuit. But there was, that, there was that Supreme Court decision recently. Gosh, I wish I could remember the name of it. It was the uh, Department of Corrections Torture. Uh, hold on. Uh, was it twenty twenty one? Oh, I don't remember the name of it. Uh, so in 2021, uh, it, there, was a, there was a qualified immunity case where basically uh, the prison guards had tortured a guy. They put him in, they put him in a cell that was cold with no clothes. There was just like a hole in the floor where he, like all the excrement stuff would have to like go through. And like they just tortured this guy. They tortured him. And they're like, oh, qualified immunity wasn't clearly established precedent. Precedent, And the Supreme Court was like, look, dude, you knew. You knew. You just knew. So no, don't give us this qualified immunity game. You just knew. You knew that you were torturing him. And you knew that torture is, is not allowed, cruel and unusual punishment, not allowed. And it doesn't have to be spelled out in minute detail. You're supposed to be able to get the idea from existing cases. And that's and that's where I think that's where I think that this court has gone a little bit awry. 
I, I don't think the court should have granted qualified immunity to the cops. Um, I mean, whereas you could, I guess, kind of make an argument on the, uh, the seizure of the, of the press conference people that the court was, I can't say the court's wrong. I, I really, I really believe the court was wrong on the seizure part. Like I really believe the court was wrong, wrong on the seizure part. So anyway, I've rambled long enough. It's probably been over an hour. Thanks for watching. Uh, I would, I guess I'll try to leave a link to the uh, opinion. It's in my discord, uh, but I'll try to leave a link to it. So you guys can uh, see it if you want to see it. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.